Peptides will be our next group of minerals to discuss. I believe this is Roman numeral 8. Correct me if I'm wrong in your own notes. In your textbook, the oxides are talked about from pages 368 to 389. Pretty long section full of really important minerals. All the minerals in the oxide family have the oxygen 2 minus anion bonded with a metal cation. And the bonding tends to be pretty straightforward. The chemical formulas are pretty straightforward as well. So a good example of this would be aluminum plus oxygen. And we got a oxygen 2 minus, this is a 3 plus, so you have to multiply things through together and you get corundum, Al2O3. Now the only cation that this doesn't apply to is our exception, and that is silica 4 plus. Silica 4 plus plus oxygen goes to a whole new family of minerals called the silicates which is how we're going to finish off our semester. Because of the, um, the chemistry of all these is very similar, they tend to have a lot of shared characteristics, making them a little bit hard to identify from one another, actually, and we'll wor worry about that a bit uh, in this lecture. But they tend to be dense because they have uh, uh, metals in them. That's from the metals. They tend to be hard, and they also tend to be isometric or hexagonal. I guess we could just say good symmetry, because there are, rutile is uh, tetragonal, but basically tetragonal is the lowest uh, symmetry system that they occur as. The last thing about the oxides that we want to mention up front is that these tend to be ore minerals, where the cation that's bonded with the oxygen is valuable, like TiO2 is an ore of titanium, and Fe2O3 is an ore of iron. In fact, we're going to organize our notes as um, oxides that are metal ores, and then the next lecture is going to talk about oxides that are actually gemstones, or at least that's one of the main economic significances of them. The first oxide to talk about today is hematite. Such an important and common mineral on Earth. The chemical formula is Fe2O3, and when we unpack this, because this is... Uh, so, this is, so it's 2 minus times 3. This is 6 minus. These two, in order to become 6 plus, have to be, let's just say, have to be Fe3 plus in order to maintain charge balance. Fe3 plus means that this iron is fully oxidized. That's going to matter as we go through these cations, talking about how reduced or oxidized they are. So hematite, we are fully oxidized. This is iron that has interacted with the Earth's atmosphere, which is full of oxygen, allowing for this type of reaction to occur. Our mineralogy of hematite, no, we don't write hematite there, we write mineralogy, right? Our mineralogy of hematite, well, it's a hardness of six, thereabouts, and it's a specific gravity of 5, or thereabouts, and there's a tricky thing about hematite. I don't actually think you'll have a hard time identifying it, but there is a trick here, and that there are very many forms. So I want you to put that down here. We're going to say abundant forms possible. And you know what else? There's also abundant colors. So we're going to say and colors. And let me show you a list of kind of what they are. We can have massive or granular hematite. We can have oolitic. We can have botryoidal. And we can have specular. These are all very common spec... Oh, I better spell this right. Not spectacular, but specular. Like a lot of specks and flakes. This one looks micaceous. That's what specular means, micaceous. And it's a weird one in that it is silver. And botryoidal is red to black. And oolitic and massive tends to be red. And so there's a lot of different forms and a lot of different colors. Can I prove it to you? Let me do that by inserting a picture here. And here we go. Here's the massive red variety, a black oolitic variety, and a silver specular variety. But no matter the color, black, red, or silver, they're all going to have the same streak. And so we're going to put, this is kind of our star here, and oh, that is so sloppy. Do yours better. 
we're going to say that they all have red streak. Now that's what the textbook says. It says red streak. If you were to go test every single hematite in the collection, you're going to see that the streak is actually kind of a red to brown. But you can learn what that color is and then be confident in your identification of hematite. Our geologic occurrence of hematite is so um, abundant across Earth. And so we need to kind of identify it, but also say it in a short way. And so I'm going to say it this way. It's that it occurs in oxidized sedimentary sedimentary environments. These are places, well, what can we say? We know that the earth has tons of iron. So let's just say this. Iron is very common in crust. And we can also know that oxygen is in atmosphere. So at any time, iron in the crust gets exposed to oxygen in the atmosphere. You could almost like do an equation here. Iron in the crust plus oxygen in the atmosphere equals hematite. And what would this equation look like in pictorial form? Well, it might be something like this. Anytime we see sedimentary rocks that have hues of orange and red and yellow, this kind of thing right here, this is what I'm talking about as iron that was present in the rock has been oxidized and turned red. If we were to look at a chunk of this orange rock in microscope view, like here, we would end up seeing that hematite is this stain. See this uh, stain right here on the margin of the grain or here on the margin, that kind of orange? That's the, um, the presence of hematite that ends up staining these rocks. And so what we're going to just say is I want you to just say that um, hematite grains, coatings, and cements stain said rocks. Shales, silts, sandstones, it's all the same process. We're getting these coatings primarily along the grains that give the red color. Another one of the more common geologic occurrences is banded iron formations. And this is maybe going a little deep, but I do want you to know that most of our banded iron formations, commonly referred to as BIFs, they form because of this oxidation reaction. And the one of the interesting things about banded iron formations is they formed early in the Earth's history. And we think they formed by this process. So here's our ocean. That's supposed to be waves. So we glitched out a little bit. Here's our waves in our early ocean. And the early Earth's ocean was thought to be pretty enriched in iron. So we're having some iron kind of floating around as a dissolved constituent in the ocean. So we're going to say iron enriched in Earth's early oceans. That is step one to make a BIF. And step two is that cyanobacteria evolve. Cyanobacteria evolve in the Earth's oceans. And one of the things about plant type life, if I'm not a paleontologist, I hope that wasn't like an egregious thing to say, but basically let's think about this as a plant, is that they pres respire, not perspire, they respire CO2. Nope. They respire. This is just all kinds of sloppy. Let's just erase this. The cyanobacteria evolve and they respire oxygen. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in some cyanobacteria, all kind of living at a certain depth in the ocean here, the perfect depth where they can't get eaten, but they can metabolize sunlight and CO2 that's in the ocean and make oxygen. And so as they are making oxygen, that oxygen is going to bond with the iron. So step three, oops, three, Fe that's floating around mixes with the oxygen from the cyanobacteria to produce Fe2O3. And that Fe2O3 ends up sinking to the seafloor, precipitating out, forming beds of red hematite. And there'll also be like sandstone layers that get deposited that 
then get interbedded with additional hematite, and then maybe a shale gets deposited. And so we can get this banded sequence on ancient ocean floors we call banded iron formation. So we're going to say Fe203 precipitates on ocean floor. On ocean floor. That's a really neat history, or like part of the story of Earth's history, and they call this event the oxygenation event. So oxygen starts to form on Earth because of the evolving of critters. Now our significance of hematite, before we move on to other minerals, so let's go three, significance. This is our major ore for iron. In fact, it's so important that we mine something like a hundred million tons of hematite a year, just for our, you know, industrial purposes. That's the story of hematite. Now, I want to go through a few more minerals, actually four more, before this lecture is over. We don't need to get into any of them, any of them as deep as we did hematite, but let's go into ilmenite. Now, hematite was Fe2O3. If we replace one of those irons with a titanium, we get FeTiO3, and that's the chemical formula for ilmenite. Ilmenite looks like this. Well, it's a big picture. Let me shrink it a little bit. It's a black mineral with a metallic luster, and it tends to be massive, although it doesn't have to necessarily be, but I think for this class, you're mostly going to see ilmenite as this black massive, when I say massive, I mean granular um, mineral. It also has a black streak, which is one good way to tell it apart from hematite. And it also looks a lot like magnetite, which is a mineral we haven't talked about yet. So we're just, but the key to tell those two apart is uh, ilmenite has weak to no magnetization. That's going to be some of your identification criteria for ilmenite. Our geologic occurrence is that it will occur as an accessory mineral in igneous or metamorphic rocks. And because it's pretty hard and pretty heavy, which I didn't write those numbers down here for you, but they're very similar to hematites. Uh, yeah, I didn't write them down in my notes either. It will stick around during the process of weathering, and it can also be a detrital grain. In fact, it's one of the biggest components of something called a black sand. So when people are panning for gold, they tend to find, well, very little amounts of gold, but in the pans there's a lot of black sand. That black sand is detrital ilmenite and detrital magnetite primarily. Okay, so, so that's just an example for you of the black sands that um, are part of this detrital process. So that's all I wanted to tell you about ilmenite. Let's go on to magnetite. And we're kind of keeping this shorthand too. I'm not writing out the full one, twos, and threes. The chemical formula for magnetite is Fe3O4. So it's the same components as hematite, Fe2O3, but let's break this down a little bit. The O4 gives us 8 minus, which means that Fe3 has to get to 8 plus. And the way they do that is with one Fe2 plus, and then an Fe3 plus, and another Fe3 plus. All right, so that's 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 2 gets us to 8. And so that's how we have that reaction. And so the way you read this is, these are oxidized, these are reduced. So this magnetite is slightly, I don't know why I put that in quotation marks, slightly less oxidized than hematite. It forms in a lot of the same situations as hematite, even in banded iron formations, actually. The mineralogy of magnetite, let's walk through that a bit. The problem here is that it's another black mineral. And it also has a black streak. And it has a hardness of six. It has a heft of around five. 
And so it's really similar to ilmenite, and it's really similar to the next mineral, chromite. It's, it's, uh, it's can be massive or granular. And when it does crystallize in its beautiful isometric form, actually you see octahedrons. And so octahedrons would be one of the key ways to identify magnetite. That is, if you don't have a magnet. Because the most important way to identify magnetite is that it is very strongly magnetic, so much so that you can't get this wrong if you have a magnet. Boom, the magnet will jump right to the magnetite and you have your identification basically as quick as licking a bit of salt. So that's our mineralogy. Let's do a little bit of geology. So our geologic occurrence is the same as these other places, except for it's even more. So magnetite is one of the more common minerals on Earth. It can be accessory mineral. Glitching out here a little bit. There we go, accessory. It can be detrital. It can be hydrothermal, and it can also form in banded iron formations, the BIFs. And when it forms in a BIF, magnetite actually ends up being a really important ore of iron as well. So our significance, there's two things, is that it's an ore of iron, and then it has well, it doesn't really matter so much for this anymore, but for like early sailors and navigators, iron, um, so, so magnetite was used in the compasses. So let's just say like uh, early, early navigation was one of the other important significances of magnetite. And because this is a geology class and because I know you're very interested in this, right now in today's modern geoscience community, it's used heavily in a field called paleomagnetism. And what paleomagnetism does is it uses magnetite in the rock and it allows you to solve kind of like an ancient compass. And so you can figure out the ancient rock latitude, like when the rock crystallizes from magma or something. And so if you can figure out where the rock was at some time in the past, like the Cretaceous or the Pennsylvanian, then what you can do is you can start actually figuring out where plates were in the past. So it's really important for the study of plate tectonics. That's magnetite. And now two last minerals. Oh, I better show you a picture. Let's, let's put some pictures of magnetite in before we go to the last two minerals. So what you can see in these two pictures, if you don't have a magnet, this just looks like chromite and it largely looks like ilmenite. It's hard to identify. But if you put a magnet to it, boom, it's going to stick. This sample, on the other hand, you should be able to identify as magnetite because it's black with a, a, a somewhat metallic luster, and you can see the beautiful octahedrons of euhedral magnetite. All right, our last two minerals are going to be chromite and pyrolusite. We're mentioning chromite mostly because it is a very valuable ore of chrome. And it has a chemical formula, FeCr2O. Four, and it is black, it is isometric, and it, it can be uh, massive to granular. It can be really hard to identify with ilmenite. And so what I would look for when I'm identifying chromite is I'm going to look for what, what the textbook calls a submetallic luster. What this means is, is that it's slightly more pitchy to resinous than just, um, than ilmenite would be. I do have a picture of it. I'm not sure that it's perfect, but when you look at this, you can see, well, it is a metallic mineral, but maybe it looks a little bit more like coal than the other ones have, right? See how these are a little more shiny? That's one thing to key your eye into as you're trying to identify um, chromite. As for our geologic significance of chromite, it is our only ore for chromium, which is very important in the steel industry and also like, uh, I don't know, like chroming out your car or your motorcycle, and it makes it worth a lot of money. So people look for chrome in different geologic environments, primarily in mantle rocks, where it can be enriched in peridotites. And let's just leave it right there. So the main source for chrome is going to be in mantle rocks exposed at Earth's surface. 
and you're going to have to wait until next semester in petrology to maybe learn more about the geologic processes that will bring this mantle to the Earth's surface. And then finally, our last mineral for today, I feel like this lecture's gotten a little out of hand with its length, it's pyrolusite, which is our manganese oxide, and it is our only ore, our primary ore, for manganese. So it is worth money because of an ore. I think it's really cool because when it crystallizes, it forms this dendritic habit, which looks like tree branches. So anytime you see this, especially in sedimentary sequences, um, maybe near some kind of hydrothermal veins, then you know, ah, that black mineral is pyrolusite. So what we're going to put here is we're going to say that it crystallizes dendritic. Okay, so dendritic form is going to be diagnostic for us. When it is not dendritic, things get pretty tricky because it is a dull black mineral. It's primarily massive when it is not dendritic. And maybe one thing that can give it away from the others is that it has a hardness of about one to two. So it's actually so soft that it will wipe off on fingers. And so if you don't see the dendrites, I want you to look for dull, and dull is going to be your key that you're dealing with pyrolusite.